honored guests, esteemed colleagues. It's an honor to be here. I am Charles Tucker Jr. And I'd like to challenge Dr. Salingue, being the youngest panelist. <coughs> but uh, when looking at the panel and, and the way it was put together, I, I clearly understood that they were not saving the best for last. However, I'd like to believe that flying here all the way from the United States, I did, in fact, have something to offer. And I'm not going to give you my bio, but I'd tell you I'm a practicing attorney at the Cochran Firm, I'm a managing partner in DC, and I practice civil rights. It'll become very apparent to you why I'm here today. But I'll tell you this, I'm a former prosecutor, currently a defense attorney, operating across the United States, and currently I'm defending a consulate general of the Republic of Liberia. Unlike Dr. Salengue, again, I'm a minister, so I may preach a little this morning. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. In fact, my opening statement is when analyzing whether or not Africa in its pursuit of a ideal constitution has to its credit an opportunity to hold others accountable. And I'll get more into that. But my, my overall push will be on truth. You see, the real text that I follow, and it comes in different languages, is the Bible. John 8 and 32 in the New King James Version says, then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So I'm operating with the truth this morning. Forgive me. When looking at whether or not a country or an individual can be in a place holding someone accountable, it's a two-way street. You must first do a self-reflection, which is inward. Then you can then look outward. I submit to you, Africa, the continent, has a duty not to just look inward, but to look outward. There's a lot of individuals that they need to hold accountable. You can't pursue governance in a vacuum. And I would borrow uh, Chief Justice of Nigeria's uh, comment that it, it's, it's a cooperative, collaborative system that would operate the best. I understand that the rule of law is not in a lofty idea. Africa operating under the rule of law, the continent must do so in a collective, collaborative environment. You could, in order for you to operate in that, in order to, for it to operate collectively and collaboratively, that is the true pursuit of justice. Again, I mentioned accountability being two ways. Means that you must acknowledge that the continent must have its shortcomings, but then you must be in a position to hold others accountable. You must hold other countries accountable for their actions in the pursuit of a rule of law. My understanding is from colonial times and into present day, the African man, woman, and child have been subjected to constant abuse 
from internal and external forces. This extends to not only those within the borders of this great continent, but, all, but those of the African diaspora. The global outcry in response to this abuse must no longer go unheeded. You see, I can tell you on May 25th, 2020, for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the world stood and watched as law enforcement in the United States kneeled on George Floyd's neck, killing him for nothing more than a misdemeanor crime. The world stood in horror while many of us who operate in that criminal justice space understood Lady Justice has been peeking through the blindfolds for a long time. See, the world was finally looking at what we see as a fragmented, disjointed justice system that needed to be held accountable. You see, the atonement had to exist, but the world in the United States at least stood on the map of understanding that it had some accountability to take hold of. Only 60 days prior, on February 23rd, 2020, several white men chased down a Mr. Ahmad Aubrey and gunned him down, nothing more than for jogging through a neighborhood. Just yesterday, several of those individuals were given life sentences for their actions. You see, that would have never happened if there wasn't a push for accountability. I can tell you, starting out as a prosecutor, in order to prosecute law enforcement for their actions, in courts, of equal jurisdiction, we had challenges in doing that. So I submit that throughout the international community, there is constant and consistent disregard of the sovereignty and authority of continental Africans and Africans of the diaspora. Our nations have made continued efforts to engage in diplomatic affairs and engage in international relations in service of our national interests and to stand proudly amongst our counterparts, not only in the great continent of Mother Africa, but globally. Let's look at the evidence. Statistically speaking, you will find that in most Western countries, there is a disproportionate number of diplomats from African countries that linger in prisons, forgotten and abused, stripped of their rights. The diplomatic status is ignored, diplomatic immunity overlooked and protection granted by the, v by the Vienna Convention almost disregarded and denied with very little repercussions. These are numerous examples of the human rights violations and the denial of the diplomatic protection that have been perpetuated against government. Here's just a few examples. The arrest and trial of former deputy president of the Nigerian Senate in the United Kingdom who traveled on a diplomatic passport is a clear example. Secretary Piperek, operating according to the article in the Washington Post dated November 5th, 1993, the South African ambassador protested to the State Department of the United States that the Fairfax County, Virginia police disregarded his diplomatic status. There is also Malachi York, my client, who currently sits in a supermax prison for crimes he did not commit, awaiting justice. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, justice is at the forefront for Africa. It's time it needs to hold countries and Western uh, 
entities like the United States accountable for their actions. Accountability starts with the recognition that Africa and its diplomats abroad deserve equal protection. There are white diplomats that operate in more egregious fashion where are giving immunity. Is that fair? Is that justice? No. As Africans, we must stand up for those here on the continent and those in the diaspora and demand the respect we deserve in our engagement in diplomatic affairs and international relations. We must no longer allow our diplomatic and consular officers to have their rights and protections denied in violation of international law and human rights instruments. We must not be relegated to a substandard level of response and engagement by Western and European or even Asian nations any longer. We must stand on our sovereignty and autonomy as African nations and we must not tolerate being ignored or disregarded by any nation. And to this end, I come to you to ask you, the only way this can be accomplished if Africa comes together, north, south, east, west, the bar, the judiciary, the soul of the nation, which is the people. No one will give you justice, you have to demand justice. And, in for, the, and for that to take place, the recognition of accountable pursuit of the rule of law must happen, but it must happen as a collective effort, uniting forward that justice for all is demanded by the country and continent of Africa. And it's so justly deserved. I thank you for my time.